We're running out of excuses. <laughs> I changed up my cocktail. Oh, what'd you make? Uh, I made a Manhattan. Although I kind of eyeballed it because mm-hmm. I didn't want to have to wash my jigger again. I think if you eyeball a Manhattan, they call that a Bronx. <laughs> 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 like, with all the zingers look at me go <laughs> that's pretty quick too <laughs> that's pretty good i'm not gonna lie was that off the dome it was the worst part is that the thought process was literally just like you said manhattan and then you said he eyeballed it and my mind just went like to the the mind palace room like you know the filing cabinet that was just like new york city neighborhoods i'm like uh queens no uh <laughs> what's what's funniest what's best i don't know that was pretty good <laughs> yeah well, is your drink good? Um, it's a lit. It's not as sweet as a Manhattan ought to be, but I'm okay with that. Nice. What about you, Hans? Did you make your meal? I did. Nice. Um, pretty good. I am out of what is it? Goslings ginger beer. I think mm. is the. Oh, <laughs> I was like, you're out of Goslings, like baby ducks, or <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Oh, I'm pretty sure fever tree. So that's oh. what I have. I have that too, but I don't like it as much. It's like t- it's uh really like harsh ginger, whereas Gosling's is a little mm. bit, I don't know, a little bit lighter, a little bit sweeter. Yeah. And I think I like that better. Oh, a mule. I thought you said meal. Oh no no no. Oh no 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 like, mule. Because that's why I was thinking like a duck. <laughs> like, yeah, I was gonna make a nice roast duck here. Yeah, I was like, oh. And wait, you, Hans, you had a mule from Union Grill when we watched Jurassic Park, right? You got a mule? Uh, did I? When we were, like, sitting outside, I thought y'all got, like, your mules or something. Is that... Oh, yeah. yeah. Just because at the Union I don't know what brand they use, but I know the thing that they use that's nice is they have, like, the ginger, like, candy in there yeah, that I feel like I really like that. elevates the drink. Yeah, because that's, that's one of those things that, like, when you... Like, you can get a mule anywhere. You can get a mule... You, you are, I shouldn't say it like that. You can make a mule at home. That's just, it's going to be just as good as if you get a mule at a restaurant, but the mule yeah. at the restaurant costs $11. Oh, I am all about making your mixed drinks at home. Yeah, but I'm just, my, my point is like that, that place, it was worth it because it was like unique and that was different. I liked it. Well, and it's um $6, $3 at happy hour. Wow. Ooh. So $3 mule, that's an easy. Yeah, dang. That's like ten or twelve dollars in Philadelphia, where I <laughs> went to school. If you wanted a mule, you want to know something sad? Uh, not really, just, but continue. Just speaking of being old and feeling old, I just now realized that I didn't really eat dinner. I had a really late lunch. No, I, I did the exact same thing. Well, that just means that I this like I'm like halfway through a Moscow Mule mm. a drink. And it's it's hitting harder than it really should. Nice. I have like next to the alcohol tolerance that I have today, as opposed to what I had even five years ago, is such it's such a stark contrast. I I praise God for my Catholicism that's prevented that from happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> See, I had like a third of a Costco pizza, so I am good to go. <laughs> okay. Great. Awesome. Cue the music. But you can't check your six. It's kind of like, you know, taking a screwdriver to a gunfight. What's happening? Just like old Tom, Tom. Yeah. And I, and I, like, I really think the, the, really the point of this conversation talking about it is to spend as little time as possible talking about Born to Race Hell. This. <sighs> I think that's really <laughs> well. Okay, I do what I will say. What I My think will help this, this episode. Yeah, I do have a fun little twist this time around. So okay. if you want to talk about Born to Raise Hell without talking about Born to Raise Hell. Mm. I think I've, I've never wanted anything more in my life. I think know? I've delivered. I think actually <laughs> I've brought the perfect heat for this episode. Oh, great. All right. So uh, that's good. I mean, Hans has charge. As far so as our listeners are aware. Is that our intro? Yeah. Well, as far as our listeners are aware, the episode started pretty much right there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, we're, Zach. We're, recording time, we're 36 we minutes in. in. We haven't clapped in. <laughs> well, recording time, we're 36 minutes in. I'm 40 You minutes. folks are just starting to hear it now. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. You know, every podcast episode is written three times. Yeah. 
and the third is in the edits. Yeah, but not every podcast episode has the hosts talk for almost 40 minutes about anything other than what sure? they're here to talk about. You don't know that, Hans. It's... You don't know that. <laughs> Maybe we could start a companion pod. Maybe this is like our stealth announcement of a companion podcast. Well, I thought the companion podcast what? was Chronicles of Narnia. <laughs> oh, no, that I mean, that is true. Yeah, Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, just because this is the announcement of that. I think this is, is this the official <laughs> announcement of Chronicles of Narnia, and I, do, I just I know I don't want to explain what that is at all. I just want the audience to try and guess that at some what point that is. something will exist, and it will be form. called Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah, and that's the greatest name for any podcast ever. Is it's pretty you know, good, and I'm very excited about it. And I'm very, know. I'm very proud of Zach for coming up with that. I don't even need the thing to exist. I'm just, I just need the title <laughs> to exist. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just want the listeners to guess what that is. It drives engagement. Mm, yes, comments, <laughs> sub- reacts, reaction video, engagement. stitch this. With yeah. what you think that means. Yeah, because, oh uh, I, you know, TikTok is extending the oh. length of their videos to several hours now. So, yeah. Oh, wait, I wonder, could we upload an entire episode of Steven C. at all to TikTok? No, absolutely <laughs> they not. Put video, not they put whole movies on there. Yeah. No, I won't allow that. Which, okay, that's actually, that's also going to, oh, I'm so excited for this discussion I brought with us this week. Welcome, listeners, to Steven C. at all. Today we're talking about the 2010 movie yeah. Born to Raise Hell. We've been spending the past nearly 45 minutes avoiding talking about this movie. I really don't want to talk about this movie. <laughs> well, especially because uh, I just want to say one thing. Okay, I'm going to say more than one thing, but I want to <laughs> say one thing right now. <laughs> well, okay, I'm glad you're not literally saying one thing. Okay, that's the episode. Bye. <laughs> Imagine like an episode where most of it is the intro. We play the intro music. We say like three sentences each, and then we get the outro music. Oh, that! <laughs> this is what episode like, forty three. So that's gonna happen before we reach. Here. When you get to Steven Skull movie number forty five, what do you talk about? Yep, okay, okay. Bye. let's. Okay, but just real quick, this isn't gonna go in the episode. But I think we absolutely have to. do We that. absolutely have idea. to do that. I, I think one of these is going to be it. Like we we pick whichever one is the most bland, disgusting, <laughs> tasteless, boring, nothing movie, mm-hmm. and we just talk about something entirely different for an hour, and then we say, "Oh yeah, we we're here to talk about a movie, weren't we?" And then we spend well, three minutes on it. Roll intro. Spend three minutes on it. Roll outro. Done. Well, <laughs> psych. That movie you just described is titled "Born to Raise Hell." It is a 2010 <laughs> feature uh, starring Steven Seagal. You can check your six. Yeah, there's there is not much to talk about here, uh, but the one thing I do want to say about it is so this came out the same year as Machete, which was as we discussed in the previous episode a better Steven Seagal movie than any Steven Seagal movie, and I was really hoping that he like learned something from this. Now it did came out it did come out the same year, so maybe he didn't have time to like take what he learned from machete and apply it we'll see in the next episode but he definitely didn't if he learned anything from being on machete he did not apply it here oh we're actually we're actually a little out of order machete came out september 3rd 2010 apparently born to raise hell came out in the u oh in october of 2010 okay never mind jk october 2010 in the uk and then april 2011 in the u.s but this was literally a month later so (laughs) he did not apply lessons not time to learn anything you know, he was making these simultaneously. So, I don't know, because this one, it was stupid. It was nothing. It was boring. It was dumb. Yes. But this was the first time in a long time that Seagal has had, like, some life in him. Mm. Like, there was... He, mm. I, I have a theory about that, I, like, but continue. Keep talking. He wasn't... Uh, I don't know. You know what? No. You know what? Never mind. I take it back. I'm describe done. We plot. need to get through this. I need to, can, yeah, describe the plot, we, yeah. and then I'll tell you why you're wrong. This. But go for it. Well, no, because the more I think about it, the more... Because he like he does talk a little bit more, and he puts a little more emphasis in I think he's been it. doing it's that for the past like few movies, though. Under his breath, mumbling. Like the past three movies, I, I think he's maybe. been putting a little bit more effort into it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. doesn't yeah. matter. I need to get going. 
Seagal is part of an elite drug bust task force in Bucharest. His old partner was killed, so now he has a new one who's super incompetent. His name is Steve. Hey everybody, Hans here. I'm editing this one, and let me tell you, listening back to us recapping the plot of this dumb, dull, dreary, hateful, pathetic, wholly pointless excuse for a movie for eight whole minutes just about put me to sleep, so here's the deal. Seagal leads a drug bust task force, naturally, because it's a Seagal movie. He basically goes rogue and teams up with the drug kingpin that his task force was literally built to take down in order to illegally take out another random guy who killed Seagal's partner. That's it. No, doesn't actually make any sense. I don't get it either. I'm happy to give you those eight minutes back. Enjoy. He's locked in a room of this house, and in order to get to him, Seagal shoots the frame of the door with a shotgun for like a solid three minutes so much that he has to reload twice the shotgun in between shooting so it's like a solid three minutes of him shooting out the frame around the door and then kicks the whole wall including the door in now this would have given castell three minutes to escape, jump out a window, do literally anything else ah. while Seagal was just shooting. This is the, the part of the movie where I like I I lost my struggle against myself to stop <laughs> looking at my phone. <laughs> <laughs> this was the part that I was like actually interested in because it didn't make any sense. He could have done any like I, I again I am not the expert, but the furthest thing from it. But I don't. Like, in typical movie fashion, you would shoot out the hinges of the door. You would shoot out the lock on the door with a shotgun. You would shoot out the door handle. Anything, and then you would, like, kick the door open. No, he spends three minutes pumping round after round after round into the frame of the door so he can kick the whole wall, including the door, down. And Castell just waits for it to happen. But then, of course, because he spent all of his ammo doing that, he doesn't have any rounds left in the shotgun. <laughs> or shells, I guess, not rounds. Left in the shotgun to shoot him, so of course they have to have some kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And Seagal wins, and it's super cheesy and stupid. And then the movie ends with Seagal, the leader of this drug bust task force, whose entire mission is to take out the drug kingpin. The movie ends with Seagal meeting up with the drug kingpin and giving him tickets so that he and his son can go back to Russia and live a happy life instead of, you know, taking him to the police. Which was like the entire purpose of his shop. <laughs> and the whole reason two of his partners died. It was a, a dumb, I'm, I'm going to have to do some, some creative editing there to rip out a lot of that stuttering, but it was a dumb movie. It didn't make much sense. There was some like action in there that wasn't terrible and Seagal put in some yeah. effort but not enough and there was oh so much voiceover so much ADRing of, of someone else who's clearly not Seagal there's a reason we didn't want to talk about it it was just bad it was stupid there's just really, like really not stupid. a lot here is one of the problems no. there's not there's no depth it's just a painfully gross painfully generic uh like Seagal, like I don't know how to describe it. It's just the genre of Skull movie. Like it's, it's painfully gross, painfully generic, poorly executed action movie with no content, no meat. Yeah, it's like in a way, it's worse than his other movies because there's just the plot works, like the story beats function. But that's all they do, and so I can't even talk about like how they failed miserably. If it were worse, I could talk about it more. Yeah, I really wish... I, I yeah. can't remember what movie it was, but we had a similar complaint before. Like, this isn't Ticker. This isn't a complete unmitigated disaster where you watch and just yeah. go, how did this get made? The problem is this is just kind of vaguely, competently enough stitched together that it exists. And, like, that's all yeah. you can say about it. And you shouldn't watch it. No. I'll never watch it again. It is not worth your time. It's not worth your time. No, it's, it's bad. It's stupid. It's but poorly that's it. done. It's bad execution on a bad idea. But it's it. There's nothing. I'm trying to come up with something funny to say. And the fact that funny half of the synopsis of the movie was talking about how ridiculous this time him shooting the door open was kind of yeah. tells you what kind of movie it is. Yeah, yeah. That was the only. That was the only thing I found interesting enough to pay attention. There, to, there are only a couple <laughs> things that that really don't even have anything to do with the movie. So like, uh, Steamroller once again has a new logo. Yeah, it does. It's like, like its fifth logo now. Person for that entire studio. 
What is it was a it was a like a revolver barrel. Rotating, yeah, with a sword it? in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which later in the movie, when Seagal has his mandatory sex scene, he's wearing a Steamroller Productions branded hoodie the wait, entire what? time. Wait, what? What? Yes. yes. What? <laughs> Yes. Are you serious? I would say go back and watch it, but don't. Um, and so, can you describe what did the Steamroller Productions logo look like this time around? Uh, so it was like a six-round revolver with a sword superimposed on top of it. Yeah, you know what? Notably, the Steamroller Productions logo has never looked like a steamroller. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> they should have called it Revolver Sword Productions. <laughs> mm-hmm. But like he during his mandatory sex scene, he was wearing this hoodie that had like this logo on it that it was kind of blurry and like wasn't filmed from a great angle to, for me to see it. And I thought, is that like a Japanese lotus, or is it like the that Tokugawa family symbol? Which I thought that's absolutely something he would wear. And then I was looking closer and I thought, no, wait a second. I've seen this somewhere. What is this? <laughs> like the start of this movie. It's the steamroller logo. It's the new steamroller logo. He's wearing branded merch in his movie. We we should point out also that like it she did not come up in the synopsis at all because she does no. not matter. He has like a <laughs> this mandatory sex scene is with like a female partner, and I'm fairly certain, correct me if I'm wrong, she shows up like twice, the sex scene happens. I don't believe she appears in the movie after no. that. I no, okay. she doesn't remember her. That is the last time she's <laughs> present. Going through my notes, my first note cool that this one is available for free on almost every platform you can think of you can yes yeah, somehow if you wanted to watch this Why? movie it is the most accessible movie you've ever seen it's why on, this one it's on like every platform you can think of it's on tubi it's on roku channel it's on amazon it's on pluto it's on plex oh it's on Pl- i watched it on plex it's all for free if you just kind of tune your TV antenna, like that doesn't even work anymore because we switched to like digital broadcast. If you have your analog TV antenna, it'll be static, except Born to Raise Hell will be playing on like some frequency. Yeah. Yeah. If you just Someone's look out the window at a passing bus, it. it'll be playing. You know, when you go to the gas pump and they have those little TVs in there, they're probably playing Born to Raise Hell. <laughs> Why is it this one? Of all of the things that, <laughs> of all of his movies, to be just universally okay. available. Kind of like can, I, this tax break can I do something we've never done on this show, but I think would be really oh, illustrative do. of what this movie, the experience of watching this movie is like? I'm just going to read all of my notes. It's very few. There are like 10 notes here. I'm just going to read them all through. I already mentioned the first one. Cool, this one is available for free on almost every platform you can think of. Two. Is the steamroller going to change the logo every every movie? <laughs> Three. Some kind of tax dodging thing, I assume. Yeah, three. Oh, good. <laughs> a voiceover. Because the movie starts with a voiceover. Four. We have guns and gyrating women while the opening credits are still going. So, like, we've, we've reached the quota of gunshots and gyrating women before the opening credits have even ended. Next, Stephen has an on-screen writing credit, and I discovered later that he is the sole writer of this movie, so that makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Uh, the next one, cam- the camera work is making me sick. I can't see anything. <laughs> like, just like <laughs> scenes where pe- two people are sitting at a table talking to each other. The camera's just moving around wildly and following every motion of everything. Like, if a character, like, picks up it's a like coffee a, like, cup, Michael the Bay camera movie. will, like, follow the coffee cup. And so uh, the whole room is just moving around wildly, and I- it's making me sick. Oh, here's my favorite quote preemptively. Quote, I'm speaking English, end quote, to which I responded, dude, you're in Romania. (laughs) Why would anyone care that you're speaking English? (laughs) How would he know there's a dot on his face? So there's one moment where like one of the drug dealers who (laughs) is like short this week goes to Dimitri and he has like a sniper on him and he has like a red dot laser sight on his forehead. And he like, oh, no, except there's literally no way to know that that is on your it's on your for you can't see your own forehead i don't know anyway next uh they portray Seagal as popular but he treats everyone around him with contempt yep but that's no different from any of the rest of these that's movies no where everybody the these movies. inexplicably loves him he's the best of the best of the best and there's no one on this planet that doesn't know of him or know how good he is at what he does yeah even though he's a, a complete 
piece of garbage well, to every single this person was, he comes I remember in contact specifically, with. I made this note while he like took his woman. I don't know who this woman is to him. Like, is it a girlfriend? Is it a wife? I don't know. It, it never specifies in the movie. I uh, took her out to dinner. As he's out to dinner with this woman, he's hitting on the waitress. And she like comes over to him and says like some flirty things. Uh, and so that's when I wrote, <laughs> they portray him as popular, but he treats everyone. He's horrible to this waitress. Just horrible. <laughs> Super misogynistic, says mean things, but just continues on. As I already said, in my next note, he's wearing a steamroller branded hoodie. Uh, and then at the end, after he's become friends with Dimitri, the drug dealer, even though... The drug kingpin. Drug kingpin. That he was there to capture like his, and arrest. His whole... Raison d'etre, like the whole reason that Seagal is here for this whole movie is to catch Dimitri. <laughs> At the end of the movie, he's like become friends with Dimitri and they play this like chess game. And Dimitri <laughs> says, Dimitri's say. like looking down at the chessboard <laughs> and he says, only one man could beat me in one move. Uh, and I, and he looks up and he sees that it's Seagal. I wrote, this chess scene makes no sense. Did he not just look up through a whole chess game also chess is always one in one move you only make one move at a time i do love whenever something like this happens because it's not even like a little bit wrong there is like no single part of that that is even remotely close to how any of that should work <laughs> like was he just like had his eyes glued to the chess board? he didn't even know who sat down in front of him like at the end of the chess game he looks up and sees that it's seagal it must have taken, like, at least half an hour to play this chess game. And, like, chess is always won in one move. You only make one move at a time. And the, That's the how chess he works. he said was the worst. He said, those, he said, only one man could beat me in one move. Those must be the hands of, like, the greatest skilled chess player of all time or something Except like that. we have never seen him play chess it, this entire no, movie. No, it was just so absurd. It was the biggest ego boost. It's so stupid. Well, because Seagal had a right, it was the sole writing credit on this one. Yeah, I guess that's true. He yeah. wrote this movie, that's which it, it. it shows. He oh has his God. production company on his hoodie when he has his mandatory sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> he is the greatest his chess player sex in the world. Scene where he is fully clothed. Oh, fully in the clothed for the entire scene. Which, like, <laughs> I want to emphasize to our listeners: I don't want to see him not fully clothed. I'm not. I'm not. I don't want oh, that. No. But you would think Absolutely in a movie where not. every single movie has a mandatory sex scene, it would happen at least the one time. Like at least once, right? No, never. Not not They're even like, like in the 80s when he was skinny and athletic. Like, no. Never <laughs> happened. No, the closest we got was the gal just twirling his ponytail. Yeah. Mm. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. No, those are, that's literally all my notes for this movie. I already have my favorite line in there. I'm speaking English. He, like, yells at a guy that he's arresting. Like, don't you understand me? I'm speaking English. I'm like, you're in Romania. Like, why? <laughs> why would that mean worst... anything to this man? <laughs> What's worse than that is Aaron can't say this, but he says I'm speaking English, mother****, so it's also a Pulp Fiction ripoff. Mm. <laughs> Do you speak it? Exactly. He thinks he's Samuel L. Jackson. It's pretty bad. There were a lot of lines, of just specifically all Seagal's lines, that were dubbed over because he was probably too quiet. And it was the same deal as so many times before. Somebody that doesn't actually sound at all like him, but still puts in more effort than Seagal did. Ugh. Even when they're not using his voiceover, this, when they're not doing voiceover for him, it's ridiculous. They op, they alternate back and forth between showing currency as euros and American money in Bucharest. Yeah, which is interesting. This was the clo well, the only other thing I have written down was that this was the closest we've ever seen Seagal act like an actual police officer. That that's like you know. 3% of the way there instead of the 1% of the way there that he ever was prior. So this is not that he's actually doing any kind of accurate portrayal. No, no, no. But he does, like, he does tell his, tell, tell the people that are working beneath him to, you know, stop harassing people, stop beating people up, like, yeah. act professional. You need to make sure you clear the room properly and check under the bed and check the closets before you say that the yeah, room's clear. Yeah, like, except, okay, when he yells at his new partner for that, he didn't obviously do anything wrong he just like yells at his new partner for like not checking the room close enough or whatever but like he didn't the, the film language doesn't tell you that his new partner did anything wrong it was it was bad it was just bad yeah it was just bad 
my favorite line is the informant that dies. Uh, best character of the whole movie. Oh, absolutely. When he's still alive at the police station and Seagal offers him coffee and then tells him he doesn't have time to drink the coffee, <laughs> he gets up to leave and Steve, the new partner, says something derogatory towards him, like just a you know, snicker behind his back. Oh. And the informant says to Steve, you're the sidekick. Sidekicks never make it. And what do you know? Steve what dies. Do you know? <laughs> also, well, like, this this movie is very anti-Roma. Like, yeah. It's yeah. weird. Absurdly. Like, as someone with, like, Roma family members, this was very weird to watch. Because at first, like, you see, like, the the i'm gonna say the word gypsy i don't mean that derogatorily that's just a very historical word that's been used to refer to the roma people Uh, i have you know roma family members but like the villains refer to some of their like hitmen and drug dealers as gypsies and like oh he's just a gypsy like uh, who cares what happens to him but also like seagal like the hero of the movie it's like, oh, who cares what happened to these gypsies? He's just a gypsy. Who cares? Like, no, <laughs> what are we doing? Ugh. And like, we just pretend that Dimitri, who's been like the main villain this whole movie, three quarters of the way through, we just choose a new villain from amongst the characters. He becomes like the uh, the redeemed villain who's like the new partner of the hero, except he's changed nothing about his lifestyle, except that his family's dead now. So we're supposed to like feel better for him, except he like... He has slaves making drugs in his basement yeah. that he sells to. He's drug still dealers. a drug kingpin. Yeah, he is still <laughs> the guy supplying the dealers with drugs, who then go out and rob people. That doesn't change throughout the whole movie. He still does that by at the end of the movie. He's that is still how he makes his living <laughs> at the end of the movie. But yeah, he's supposed to. Be, you're supposed to be sympathetic. Also, the movie makes no attempt to grapple with the idea that the United States of America has foreign drug enforcement units <laughs> working in Eastern Europe. The International Drug Task Force, like it's fully funded and overseen by the United States government. Yeah, this is just a branch of the United States government For working all of in Asia a foreign and Europe, land, like working in a foreign land with zero oversight from that foreign country's government like but apparently having carte blanche like <laughs> permission to do you know diplomatic immunity to do whatever they need to get I, the whole movie i was thinking of and don't judge me <laughs> people listening to this podcast uh team america world police i was thinking <laughs> the same thing don't <laughs> worry, <yes. laughs> that yeah. it, if you want okay if you are listening to this and all thinking that you should check out born to raise hell a, you should just watch a Team America World Police, the slightly less ridiculous version of Born to Raise Hell. Mm -hmm. Because it has exactly the same amount of logic behind it, but it's marionette puppets, so it somehow, it like makes more sense, like cartoon logic. Yeah, like Durka Durka Muhammad Jihad makes more sense within the context of Team America World Police than like anything said about Roma Mm -hmm. people in this movie. Literally anything the Matt Damon puppet says in Team America World Police is more intellectual and more like argumentatively compelling than anything any character says in this. It's amazing. Okay, Hans, do you have any do you have any more like thoughts or notes or anything? Because I have gotta... any insightful no. comments to make about this piece of blank white paper that we call Born to Raise Hell? I really don't. I'm excited. There's there just just so you both know, so much of this is gonna be edited out. Like, oh, this is no, gonna be please. really short. This is gonna be a short episode, I hope. Well yeah. I've no, got, I have. I've got a second half of it. Oh, he's got a second. He's got, no, 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 I know, but that's yeah, that's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. We're gonna get we're gonna get yeah, rid of yeah, so much okay, of this. Cool, cut cool, it cool. down. Cut it down. Another the, the descriptions, everything. So, anyway, before you do that, no, I have nothing to say. Okay, I have nothing to say. This was garbage. It was boring. It was irritating. Uh-huh. But I know that Zach has something in store for us, and I'm so ready. Before to hear you it. do that, I have had two old fashions this evening. I need to pee really bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds BRB. good. Brb. Brb. Um, 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 uh, 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 um, uh, 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 um, uh, uh. All right, Zach, what you got for us? First, a question. 
this is for both of you. This is open book and open book question. Did you watch this movie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you like watched it, like you viewed the film. Uh huh. Are you about to tell me you used your freebie? No, 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 no. I did not use my freebie. I was just asking if you guys like watched it, like if you set your eyes on a sequence of mo- of moving pictures and watch this movie. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm just curious because I need you to answer that same question for me. We're gonna get in. We're gonna get in a little kind of like debate here. Answer the like oh. ask you that question? Did- no, I would like you to answer this question for me. Okay. So what does it mean to watch a movie? Ooh. Ooh. Oh my god. This is okay. not something I'm okay. Okay. qualified so to so be a part out. of. Okay. Because uh-huh. I can accurately say that I've experienced this film. Uh-huh. I can say I've in the colloquial sense I've watched this film Born to Raise Hell. But I cannot say I watched this film in insofar as my eyeballs viewed a series of images that create the illusion of motion pictures. Uh, okay. So what I'm saying is I, I watched this movie blindfolded. <laughs> okay. Like the entire thing. <laughs> so I was like, I need okay. some. I said, I really don't want to watch this movie. I need, and I need something to keep this interesting. I need something to keep it different. So I sat. I was on my couch. I pulled up the up the TV. I pulled up the image. I had a blindfold on the entire time I was watching. This <laughs> watching. This <laughs> but this is where it comes in because <laughs> what does it mean to watch a movie? <laughs> the reason I asked this is because I took every single precaution I could to mean that I, as meaningfully and as fully. And as distraction-free as possible was as fully engaged in this movie in every single way other than my eyeballs looking at the screen. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, okay. I, I did not, con- I did not have any alcohol in my system. I did not consume any alcohol for wow. like twenty-four hours plus before watching this, which is not that big of an accomplishment. No, I did not. I was going to say that makes you sound like an alcoholic. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. I really, I didn't have alcohol. I've been for the sober first, like, for five... twenty-four hours. Right. <laughs> I didn't have alcohol for like, five days leading up to this movie, but like. No, my system. I did not have any caffeine in my system for twelve hours up to leading up to this movie. Before watching this movie, I, I, I gave myself some ice water, mm-hmm. some well, not even ice water, some slightly above room temperature. Like I put some ice in there, but allowed it to melt. Some slightly above room temperature water. Yeah. I looked up and I found that the average human male bladder starts to feel the urge to pee somewhere between two hundred and three hundred fifty milliliters. So I gave myself seven what? fluid ounces of what water. Is this? Oh no, I'm way below average. I had no caffeine in my system. I had <laughs> two slices of toasted Italian bread with butter on it before watching this film. Okay. And then I sat and I watched this film without watching this film. So I did not. I like a, a sailor, I, I I strapped myself to the mast and I resisted the the strong the siren call of look at phone. I did not do that, which I cannot say for every movie we've watched in the past. I did not start doing chores like folding laundry, which I cannot say for every movie that we've done in the past. I did not, you know, get distracted, like, you know, play with Bailey. Like, I was, at every single moment, as fully engaged as humanly possible, other than I had a blindfold on and I was not watching it. So what I want to know, the reason I'm bringing this up, <laughs> is there is a sliding scale. There is a spectrum, we will call it, of what it means to have watched a movie. And so at the one end is like zero. Zero is what is that? I've never heard of that. I've never even opened it. Goodfellas, what's that? I've never heard of it. That's zero. Is you don't even like know the movie Ouch. exists. But continue. A hundred percent is like a hundred percent would be like I was in a theater, a dark theater, no distractions, no phone, watching like I had like seventy those millimeter under film. My eyelids that kept my eyes open yes. the entire time. Like I am watching <laughs> seventy millimeter film, like fully the most surround sound possible, and I have experienced this. Like that is a hundred percent watching a movie. That's un. There is no way you can debate that as not watching a movie. Mm-hmm. Somewhere between the two, there is a point where you say. You didn't really. You watched it, but you didn't really watch mm-hmm. it. And I kind of in this, mm. in this transgressive conceptual performance art piece, I myself as the artist ask my participants and my audience to question what it means to watch a film. Yeah, but I and whether so, I watch so the film. What I really think this gets down to is, you know, is this Just a podcast? ontologically, what does it mean to watch a movie? Well, you know, is this a podcast or is this a performance art piece? 
I think, well, I well, I think ordinarily this is a podcast, <laughs> and that is the lowest of the low. So I'm elevating this. I have brought us into in the second half mm. conceptual that, arts performance. Does that sliding scale have within it another sliding scale that that determines whether how how much of it you could say that you could have actually watched based on the quality of what it is that you're looking oh, at. No, well, okay, no, no. so here's the thing. So wait, wait, wait hold on, let me. So okay. I I want to be very clear. I am not looking for I am not looking to to give my here is my correct answer. For me it is the conversation that matters. Oh yeah. Like if you ask my the man The Socratic dialectic is Yeah, is if the you goal if here. you ask my man David Lynch, he would say People will say people will watch a movie on their telephone and they will think they have watched a movie and they have not watched a movie. So mm-hmm. he his perspective is probably different from yours. But mm-hmm. if you're asking him, he'd say if you watch it on your phone, you didn't really watch the movie. I'm not saying that's correct, but mm-hmm. I want to interrogate this Ooh, and know for you okay. well, so, to your so, center ontologically yeah, 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 to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the minimum yeah. requirement to have watched mm-hmm. a movie? Let me put my philosophy degree to work. Yeah, and, <laughs> and did I watch this one? Uh huh. Because I didn't go ahead watch and... it literally. But can can I say I watched this movie? I'm going to go ahead and put my two cents out there only because I I need to leave Aaron more time cuz his answer is going to be a lot more. <laughs> He's going to give than 3 mine. cents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll give 2 cents and a hay penny. To me, and this is based on nothing. I have no I don't have a philosophy degree. I have no basis in this. This is pure gut feeling. To me, yes, you watched it. But that is because this movie having your eyes open I can tell you made no difference. <laughs> so you think the <laughs> when you're like, when you're, you're watching a gunfight affects the answer. When when you're watching yes, absolutely. When you're watching a gunfight in this movie, it is not apparent which side there which side is on which side, whose side you're actually looking at, who's shooting at who. The only face you can recognize is Seagal, and half the time it looks kind of like he's shooting at his own people. You don't know. It really doesn't make any difference. But mm. if you tried the same experiment with something like say dune that has incredible special effects and the environment in which that story takes place is such a big part of the story itself then i would have to say no you didn't watch that movie okay now see this is not fully a counter but uh what i think to be a very humorous addendum to that's because (laughs) i had an interesting experience during the first half of this recording because when i got (laughs) to the end i got to a point where i went oh it's another generic action scene that was like shooting and i 100 percent just assumed exactly what you described i don't even know who's shooting at whom things are just going on camera work is going to be a mess i did not realize there's a scene where he empties like three entire like tubes of shotgun into a door (laughs) like i heard him shooting the shotgun i never in a million years considered that he was shooting around this door to kick it in so <laughs> I just want to make that sure that's actually, known. That's really funny. I didn't like when you got to that, that part, I'm just sitting here like, what? <laughs> I just like, oh, it's generic action scene. I can just kind of sit here for the next 10 minutes and assume I'll be hearing like the same thing, like the same bad music looping or the same competent <laughs> but forgettable music looping for the next 10 minutes while just like gunshots are fired and like not miss anything. I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> so for you... You, you won't fully kind of say what we'll be watching, but you think that the craft of the movie determines how much attention you need to give to it in order to say if you've watched it. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. See, that's very interesting. That's why I asked, because that's no, a that's, funny that's, answer. That's, that's an interesting I, answer. Yeah. I, can, I can confidently say that I have watched every single Seagal movie that we have talked mm. about with thus the, far. With the amount of but watch if, it deserves. Exactly. Well, but not that it deserves, just that I gave it. Mm. I can still, with whatever I gave it, whether it deserved none or more, whatever I gave it, I'm still confident that I can tell you that I have watched those movies. If I gave that same amount of attention to any other film that I would consider like a truly great movie that deserves my full attention, and I would happily give it my full attention, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to say that I watched it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like if you just had The Godfather kind of on in the background while you scrolled film, you would not say you watched The Godfather? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 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 I this is like that, yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the episode of Seinfeld where Newman catches Jerry making out with his girlfriend during Schindler's List. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like that. If you you couldn't say that you actually saw Schindler's List, but if it wasn't Schindler's List that was playing in that theater, if it was what the hell was this movie called? Born Born to Raise Hell. <laughs> Born to Raise Hell playing in that theater, he could probably get the gist of it. 
but also mm. don't take it don't okay. take a date to born to raise hell and make out in the theater that movie. Okay. that's a bad date movie okay. there are some yeah. there are a couple layers here let's dissect these layers yeah oh there's so many that's one yeah let's hear what that philosophy degrees has to say okay so i'm gonna make a distinction between so philosophy is the science of distinctions Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to make a distinction between having seen a movie and having watched a movie. I will say that uh, Zachary Raymond Weiberg has neither seen nor watched Born to Raise Hell. (laughs) Okay. I have seen Born to Raise Hell, but I have not watched Born to Raise Hell. Because just like you, I did not know that there was a scene where he like blows out the frame around a door with a shotgun (laughs) because I was on my phone at the the time. Is this the (laughs) metric that we're using? (laughs) Is this the like formal well, logic? Because like, that was the QED. Well, but that was did the you, only did you thing, know the door thing? That that was the only thing worth mentioning. We talked about the plot of the movie, but that was the only thing that stood out from basic like this door he shot was more important than the char- the main character's wife. Now, like, <laughs> no. <laughs> now the reason I say that because it because that door had more screen time than the main character's wife, Zach, well, was, and it was less flat of character. Get it? Funny. It was <laughs> um, wait, Aaron. So can you just real quick though give us like a when you say seen versus watched. Yeah, so so Hans made a very interesting criterion for having watched a movie. And I correct me if I'm wrong, Hans, but I think you're not making a distinction between seen and watched a movie. No. I think you're using those terms interchangeably. Yes. Okay. So uh, from what I understand from your position is that if you can sufficiently summarize or synopsize the film based on your experience of it, then you have either seen or watched this movie. Does that? No, only because Zach can, uh, it's the, it's the same thing at the blindfold experiment. If you apply it to say this movie, Mm. Zach could give a recap of this movie and that would qualify. But if you had a blindfold on during something like, like Dune part one, Dune, I'm I'm just going to keep using that. I'm struggling. Yeah. Vinny does know Dune part one. Which is a very visual right, something, experience. Exactly. Something like that, I don't think that that would qualify because you didn't experience that. Yeah. M- maybe I'm talking, maybe I'm thinking more along the lines of experience, but mm. you did not experience that to the fullest extent that you could okay. have. Whereas okay. <laughs> having a blindfold on during Born to Raise Hell, you still experience it to the same amount. Okay. So. <laughs> It's about experience and then communication of that experience to another who has not experienced or who has experienced and with whom you share a common experience, right? Mm-hmm. So like, uh, Zachary, you have experienced this film. We'll talk about seeing and watching both as experiences mm-hmm. of a film. You have experienced this film in such a way that you can synopsize the film to someone who has experienced the film, maybe in a different way, that would communicate to that other person that you've experienced the film. Can we all agree on that? Yes. Like you can yeah. speak yeah. about yeah. the film intelligently enough that you could convince someone who has like locked in, absorbed every part of it that you've seen it. Well, unless they say, what did you think about the door? And what did you think? Okay. Unless they say, <laughs> but yes, the door exception notwithstanding. Yeah. I would. Agree yeah. With, okay. Yes. Uh, but that wasn't a, a, an important enough plot element to this. That was, that was, the one that was the was the story. Ex- no. Exactly. That was the only standout. That was the only thing that, that made any kind of a difference. Yeah, whereas, but it really, it really didn't change yeah. anything about the plot. It didn't change the story. It didn't change the outcome. Yeah. Whereas, certainly. comparing to Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part One, uh, when Shai Hulud first raises from the sands and absorbs mm-hmm. the sand crawler, uh, which mm-hmm. harvests the spice melange from the surface of Arrakis. Uh, that's a very visual experience. You have not experienced Absolutely. that. If when, you were when you saw the size of people next to the sand crawler, and then you saw the sand crawler go down that worm's gullet, yeah. and you get that sense of scale, you wouldn't, and that, that's incredibly important to the story, and you wouldn't otherwise have that. Yes. Um, now, I see, I see a problem here. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Please, <laughs> please do tell. So, I think that even though I will say. And I know I'm speaking with like my Barack Obama cadence here. <laughs> uh, let me be clear. <laughs> let me be clear. I think that even though I think even on an objective scale, and Zachary, we've had many conversations about the objective qualities of art before for like a decade at this point. 
Uh, we've gone back and forth on this. I think even though like on an objective scale, I don't think Born to Raise Hell rises to like the objective <laughs> level of artistry as Denis Villeneuve's Dune Part 1 starring Timothy Chalamet. I do you know think... other movies exist, right? <laughs> That's the... <laughs> but it's a, it's a visual on, feast for I, the eyes. I, didn't, I, I did not mean interrupts. Go on. <laughs> okay, Greta Gerwig's Barbie. <laughs> That's the only Barbie. one I could come up with. Yes. Okay. Sure. I don't think it rises to that level of artistic skill applied to the telling of this experience. <laughs> but I do think that a movie is a necessarily audio visual mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. and that to not experience the visuals means that you have not experienced the art it's the i think it would be like the difference between seeing a painting and hearing a very detailed description of the painting if i hear an incredibly detailed description of you know like a picasso i could give that description back to someone and convince them that I've seen it, even though I've not actually seen it or even a picture of it, but just have heard or read Mm -hmm. a description of it. Film as an essentially has two components, sound and visuals. And even if the visuals are not well crafted, if I have completely removed them, I will say that I have not, experience the ascent the two essential elements of this art form which is sound and visuals i've removed one you have a overall agree with what you're saying i just want no i I overall agree i just want to tweak it a little yeah go for it because i think what you're like your example there it's really just with the example when you mentioned the uh like hearing a description of a painting Mm -hmm. i think that would be more comparable to if i like read the synopsis on wikipedia without watching it yeah so that's what you say it's more like if i saw the mona lisa but like in black and white so like i so like what you're saying is i got missing here it's an audio visual i got 50 percent yeah of the art delivered to brain Mm -hmm. so if there's some way you could come up with a similar comparison where like you were getting 50 percent of the meaning of her work yeah actually i think i i'm kind of in a camp that uh film well, we can film is flexible it because be sometimes yeah. it's more audio than it is visual yeah. sometimes it's more visual than it is audio so like uh in the film gravity That's where my scale is uh in the film gravity there are sections which are very effective which are completely silent but just the visuals alone create mm-hmm. tension within the viewer and then there are some uh films like horror movies do this really well where you'll have scenes of complete darkness and just the audio will tell you what's happening and it creates a, a different experience within the viewer. So do you think if the movie meaningfully has a different percentage in that regard, that would kind of change your opinion on the scene versus watched? I, I think so. So like someone who has seen a film has just like watched it and passively absorbed mm-hmm. some meaning from it. But someone who has watched a film has like locked in and, mm. and tried to understand it as a piece of art like so i would say i have seen born to raise hell i don't know if i watched born to raise hell because i wasn't paying very much attention because i completely missed the whole shotgun blow out the door scene (laughs) uh which because i knew we got into the final shootout and i'm like there's only one way this can go to watch this yeah i don't really need to watch this the end is my my will to not look at my phone was conquered by my understanding that this is a Steven Seagal film and there's no way this can end any way other than Seagal oh, killing yeah. everyone in here and surviving oh, in to the, the ontological end. debate of what it means to see, watch, experience a film. The look at phone is our strongest enemy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look at phone is the most contentious thorny issue. Yeah. Uh, I don't issue. think there's, there's nothing about that that I would debate, though. I think mm-hmm. that makes yeah, perfect yeah, sense. Yeah. Well, like, well, the reason I just asked there at the end, like, you know, kind of, I, you can't really watch a movie and say this movie is 40% sound, 60% visual. But like, if I were to put on The Gold Rush by Charlie Chaplin and blindfolded myself, no, I did not watch that movie. <laughs> I did not see that movie. Yeah. No, no. I, heard, I listened to a nice little piano track for like 60 minutes. <laughs> yeah. That's a good experiment. I like that. And so wait, did you say I saw or what? What was your... I would say that you have neither seen nor watched... Oh, okay. Neither seen nor watched. No. But I have in some way experienced. You have in some answer. way. You've experienced the film. Can I still give it a letterbox rating? Um, That's what really matters. I think you can give it a letterbox rating Be- because with, asterisk, when, with a heavy asterisk. With a, Okay. Because this has taken it from theory <laughs> to practical. Like, sure, yeah. it works in theory. Does it work in practice? Yeah. Can I get can I shit on this movie on letterbox.com? 
Uh, yeah, that's like you see uh, reviews on Amazon that say they, they have to put an asterisk in there that says I was given this product for free. Or like you have to put an asterisk on your review that says I did see this blindfold. Wait, have you seen the subreddit that's just like people leaving negative reviews on recipes where they yes, admit that they changed I part of the recipe? About this <laughs> yes, yesterday. yes, I showed that to <laughs> yes, you. Like I that. love that sub. <laughs> it's like that. I, I watched the movie blindfolded, but like here's my review. <laughs> or like... Uh, if you ever see on like Amazon or something, like reviews for products they haven't opened yet. It's like, mm-hmm. I've just received the package, haven't used it yet. Looks great. Completely yeah. useless review. And that'll be a one star yeah. review. So in, so I can give a review, but it's a useless review. Well, you can give a review, but you have you have to give an addendum. Like, what are you reviewing? Because I have, like, like the, ethically disclose the nature of the way. Yeah. I so like the Amazon reviewer right. who hasn't read the book that they received in the mail yet can review part of the experience of the book which is receiving it in the mail but they can't review like the content of the book <laughs> yet right so how much i'm not going to do this this is purely hypothetical yeah but like how much would i have to put this on and like fully watch with my eyeballs in order to have would it have to be a complete <laughs> rewatch or if i got halfway can i be like okay i listened to the whole thing and now i've watched like 50 percent. so i've oh, like so experienced 75 percent of this movie i think this is like this the, is going to be the, the most r- difficult question in yeah. in response to this i'm going to give you a wrong answer <laughs> i'm going to give you the wrong answer because i know aaron can give you a, a better answer than this but i'm going to tell you you have to go back and watch the scene where he shoots the door <laughs> out of the wall because apparently that's the only significant difference between watching this movie blindfolded and watching this movie not blindfolded <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm gonna be honest. I I didn't do. There's no way I did this on purpose. I inadvertently <laughs> picked the perfect like movie for this experiment mm-hmm. because it was even more generic than all the movies we've watched in the past. Like as soon as it started, I knew that this movie was like 110 percent generic, and it literally begins and ends with voiceover. Yeah. So like you could not ask for more perfect. Like <laughs> yeah, they they were holding my hand so tightly throughout this movie, I could not be led astray. Yeah. So I. So it's so difficult because so you didn't absorb any of the visuals of this at all. I I have not seen a single frame Amazing. of this picture. So I would say because of the definition of the medium of film, that in order to claim that you've seen it, you would have to watch, you'd have to like look at the screen for the the whole thing. But <laughs> I think you could leave it on mute and it would be fine. <laughs> 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 but wait, but you said the whole thing. Can I can I look at phone? If I look at like I mean like I looked at phone, I saw because I like so there are certain moments in the film that are like plot elements and then there's stuff between plot elements. So in a good movie, the stuff between plot elements would move you from plot element to plot element. This is not a good movie. So I do think quality does have some effect on this, like Han said. Like in uh <sighs> Denis Villeneuve's doing <laughs> Dune part one. Dune part one. I, part two still coming. I do think <laughs> that the vast majority of the things between the plot beats do matter because they move you from plot beat to plot beat. Here, not so much. I think that's where like the the quality of the artistry comes into effect because as long as you see the major plot beats, like the door is a the door they get shotgunned open is kind of an interesting metric because it has no plot significance at all but it does mean that i didn't i didn't actually watch the whole movie because i didn't see that but i didn't miss anything of the plot uh so i saw all the visuals which were essential to the telling of the story yes zachary this is i just want to say i'm having so much fun okay so here <laughs> well because here's my here's my hot take i i did not start the, like like i said I'm not even going to, like, pass on my opinion. I did not, like, I didn't, like, start this, like, ha, 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 I'll be a contrarian and argue with what you say because, like, I've not, like, truly disagreed with a single thing a person said on this podcast. Mm -hmm. So, heads up, being, like, a contrarian, overrated. Yeah. Prompt interesting discussion. It's super fun because every time one of these guys says something, (laughs) I, like, immediately have, like, oh, I have something I really want to ask now. Yeah. Like, I'm just having so much fun asking. Oh, this is a very good idea. Just because we got into you, you started talking about like you know essentially the understanding of plot beats and moving from plot beats to another one another. When we get into like abstract film that does not have mm, linear yeah. plots, would that affect your opinion on this? Yes, because once you move to uh, abstraction, which moves beyond plot, I think in order to claim to have seen the movie, I think the claim to have seen the abstract film is the same 
claim as having watched the abstract film. I think uh, without the construct of narr- I'm going to get really pretentious and up my own butt in here. Uh, I think without the construct of narrative to have seen and to have watched lose the distinctive difference like the specific difference between those two categories of experience have lost their inherent meaning and they become the same thing like there's no difference between having seen and having watched an abstract film to to see is to watch the purpose of the abstract film is to experience the visuals not to absorb a story not to understand like a story and a progression of events but simply to experience the visuals and and audio. So are there any feature presentations that you would say you need to see it like on film in the theater in IMAX? And like, are there any that you would say you have? There probably are like, I want to be very clear there again, non-literally I, there are, I think there are absolute movies. That all three of us would be like, Oh, you haven't seen this until you've like, you seen it in IMAX. But yeah. like, would you literally agree with that? Not like that. Weirdly enough. I would say, okay, here's like a really silly example. Good. I would say you've not seen Troll 2 until you've seen it in a room with like 10 dudes and everyone drinking beers. (laughs) Mm, I like it. Good example. I'm on board. Or like you've not really seen Velocipaster until you've seen it with a priest in the room. (laughs) I do appreciate that I was like, I don't, you know, fully accept like you know higher versus like high brow versus low brow you know whatever yeah. we don't need to get into it but i do like how my example like i'm thinking when i ask the question is there any high art like if you didn't see citizen kane in a the theater have you seen citizen kane and you're like you need to watch troll 2 in a dingy basement <laughs> yes. with like a bunch of brewskis yeah and, like <laughs> that's how that movie well, that, you like that's answer the question about. with that's, like a complete different answer. that's how that movie's meant to that's be what we're talking about that's that's exactly that's how you're su- how you should generally how it is generally agree that you should experience those films yeah like the room, I could not bring myself oh. to watch the room by Don't myself. Watch that by yourself. I could only watch it when oh <laughs> when you came to my house and we watched it together, and even that was incredibly awkward. Oh <laughs> no, you need to have at least two other friends in the room <laughs> and, and have a lot more liquor in your system yeah. than I did that day. Like event- yeah, no. Yeah. What's really fun is just sitting on a couch with w- exactly one other fella and watching that movie. No, <laughs> horrible. That's not weird or awkward. No, or like you're not regretting um, your film suggestion that night. Let me tell you. Like uh, I was thinking uh, when we were preparing to watch Machete, I was over at my parents' house that day, and I thought, hey, you know, I might invite my dad to watch Machete with me. Oh, and then I did. I did. I ended up not. I ended up not inviting him. And then I watched Machete on my own. I thought (laughs) I am really glad I didn't invite my dad to watch Machete with me (laughs) because that would have changed the experience of this film completely. Yeah. Can I invite your dad to watch Machete with me? (laughs) If you want to, yeah, go for it. (laughs) But like, there are just elements of Machete that I know wouldn't go over well. Not like go over well with my dad. I think he would enjoy that movie watching it on his own. But watching it with mm. me, his Catholic mm. priest son specifically, I don't mm. know if that. <laughs> You're putting your dad in a very uncommon position. So that's hard. Yeah. To deal with. Yeah. So like the the proper experience for the experience. experiencing any piece of art, I don't think is entirely determined by the artist. There is a subjective component of the experience of art, which moves mm-hmm. beyond the creator of the piece and like that is just fully out of their hands yeah i cannot like, like i cannot can as, try an artist, as they may they cannot control yeah i cannot as an artist control 100 percent how i'm not an art i don't know if i've created anything like we could call art um this is okay, art this is cool art. this is what we do every wednesday well, so is like art. You, to you it might not be good art but it's on, still art an example from earlier on in this very episode <laughs> Like, I can't control whether or not you're listening to this on the toilet. I would recommend that you don't, right? I think that changes the experience a bit. So, you know, this is where Aaron and I are different because I can control. You are not allowed to listen to this on the toilet. And that is 100% legally, morally, ethically binding. As the artist of this film, you cannot... You can try as you may... 
You can get together with your buddies and debate how to separate the art from the artist. You can't separate it from me. Like it, I'm if, here. Like if I'm reading, <laughs> I am the art. You know, if okay, so just like to use that to talk about like another art form that might il- illustrate this. You know, People Magazine. You can read that on the toilet. Who cares? Grapes of Wrath. Don't read that on the toilet. What are you doing? <laughs> but like, right? I don't know. That's I don't know if you can read I think Steinbeck out of all the, the like toilet. classical authors that we read in like high school, Steinbeck would be the most likely to be like, you know what? Yeah, go ahead. Like, <laughs> and meanwhile, and Steinbeck would absolutely. They probably wrote that thing on the oh, toilet. But, like, if we're yeah, being I guess. I guess. And F. Scott Fitzgerald, maybe not. Like, should you read War and Peace mm-hmm. on the toilet? Like, I don't know if that really grants the experience that you know Tolstoy was going for. Just the facts. That Stephen C. et al. is in the same breath as War and Peace and the Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> I mean, you understand art by comparing it to the great masters, right? So That's true. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Any other no fun discussions on this? You think we've no uh, star rating? Bled all squeezed all the the blood from the stone. So thank. Well, first of all, thank you. I, I want to you know for all of you in this call and listening for engaging in the transgressive cross media conceptual performance art piece known as Steven see it all episode, whatever born to raise hell, where we discuss what it means to watch <laughs> versus experience and yeah. what it means to ontologically have watched a film. Yeah. So yeah. Have we really approached the noumenal reality of this film? If you yeah. have any thoughts, leave them in the, comments on twitter spotify however that works we don't do any of that stuff we don't clearly we don't do we don't do ads we don't do calls to media on 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 social networks we don't you know fully seo we would not spend an hour talking about if i want we don't have advertisers and we're not getting any soon if you listen to this episode that's pretty obvious seeing as i'm pretty sure this podcast is worth like half a college credit (laughs) <laughs> if you have products and services to sell and you've listened this far yeah, they better be textbooks gonna sell them here <laughs> you can try you can give us money and we'll tell people that maybe i don't know i think the will. only companies that can advertise on this podcast at this point are like art supplies makers and like penguin publishing or like master class or the great courses <laughs> or Khan academy or something i don't know <laughs> Uh, yeah. We reach out. You have our contact info, maybe. Our people will talk to your people. <laughs> but man, this is art. I'm in, we're artists. We, I am art. We're not selling out to commerce, man. No, no, no. This is art. No money involved. Did we give star ratings? No. One star. Yeah, one star. I get, I, one star. one star. Easily one star. My favorite quote. What would you watch instead? Wait, wait, hold on. I didn't say my oh, favorite yeah, quote. Yeah, yeah, go for my it. favorite quote was, uh, oh, oh, now I'm blanking on it. Oh, it was at the end when he's doing his, like, truly Blade Runner theatrical cut quality monologue. <laughs> for some reason, when he says, you know, uh, I hope it was all worth it, this, you know, led to the death of my partner six months ago and then my new partner, Steve. For some reason, just the fact that he doesn't say the name of the first one, but then does say the name of the second one made it funny. It's like my first partner and then his replacement, Steve. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, not Steve. <laughs> like, I don't know why that just made me laugh. What would I watch yeah. instead? Unshian Andalou, Salvador by Salvador Dali. Dune. Of course, <laughs> Dune Part 1. Um, Dune I by David actually, Lynch. My, actually, you can watch that yeah, instead. I'd watch that. My real answer was going to be the born identity. Oh, ooh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Actually, ooh, wait, hold on. I missed the chance to be really clever. Oh, no. We'll have to edit it back in. You still have that chance. Well, when you ask what I movie... I won't edit it back in, but you still have that chance. When you ask what movie would I watch instead... <laughs> have you really watched... <laughs> Can you even watch a movie instead? Have I... Can I say I've watched this movie to recommend another one instead? Yeah. <laughs> That's a cop out. You can experience see versus watch versus absorb. Experience, absorb, digest. Any movie. Instead. Consume. I think we're taking the philosophical discussion a little bit. No, I'm too, too far, far into my own now. navel. <laughs> I <laughs> You've awakened something in me. We have we have navel gazed into the abyss and the abyss said, "Okay, dude, 
cool it. <laughs> You're getting a little too pretentious here. <laughs> What would I want? Uh, oh, my favorite quote. I'm speaking English. Is that so hard to understand? Yes, you're in Romania. <laughs> what should you watch instead? You should watch Troll 2 under the caveat that there are like five to ten other people in the room and you're, you've are you all had at least two beers. Or you can watch Velocipastor, preferably with like a practicing Catholic in the room. <laughs> but like a cool one who, yeah. like, who gets what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, those are my suggestions. All right. Born to raise hell. More like bored to raise hell. <laughs> more like bored as hell. There ah, you go. More like born to raise my blood pressure. <laughs> more like born into a new and brave age of new media. <laughs> I don't I don't know. I've used all my brain power for the, la- in the last hour. I've used it all up. <laughs> That means one of us has to die. Okay. <laughs> nice. Thanks. <laughs> that's that's definitely making it into the episode. <laughs> That'll be the post episode stinger. <laughs> oh, no. like the just imagine you music. listen to a whole hour-long episode of a podcast in the end just like the a loud belch and that's it <laughs> that's so mean that's awesome that's exactly something hans would do i've thought so many times about having the post episode stinger be a combination of all of our little like vocal foibles <laughs> oh no so just like every cough, every pause, every <laughs> every every like um every no please don't do all that. of those just all of them like rapid fire. <laughs> do do it, do it. <laughs> I want someone to throw up in their car. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want a lot for Christmas. Yeah, that's kind of how Mariah sings it. Although for me... There is just one thing I need. <laughs>